Uh, I, uh, though I am a prof here, I still identify as a working journalist. Um, I spent 10 years uh, in journalism, uh, working mostly in newspapers before I ever went through uh, a fact check. Um, once upon a time, I was on the investigative team at the Toronto Star, uh, writing stories that uh, terrified me as a reporter because I was terrified of making, uh, making mistakes. And the newspaper went to bed at went to bed, went to press at 11.30 uh, p.m. And I would be sitting at my desk um, all tied up uh, with a pen in my hand, uh, crossing out every single word in my copy. Uh, and I was trying to do my own fact checking. A very flawed design um, because in doing that, uh, I, was, I was in a danger zone of uh, mistaking what I thought I knew for uh, what I actually knew. Uh, so I made mistakes. Every journalist makes mistakes. Um, and uh, uh, in a newspaper environment, you, 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 know, you, you end up just printing corrections. Um, so uh, after 10 years of doing that, I ended up in magazines. And in 2015, I wrote a story, uh, my first story for the walrus. And I remember um, I, I knew that I was going to go through a fact check, but I didn't know what that meant. Um, I think a lot of journalists out there still don't know uh, what this means until you've experienced it. Um, and it's an, it's an exercise in annotating every single thing in your story. Uh, Vivian was the very first fact checker uh, I, I got the privilege of working with. Uh, I don't remember how many annotations were on that story. I'm sure there were some holes. And I know that you caught some things that I, I thought I had that were rock solid that um, I had misinterpreted. Um, to give just a little bit of an understanding of what some of these stories go through, what an annotation looks like, uh, the last one that I did was, uh, was a 5,000 word story and it had 313 annotations. Um, I think in the academic world, we get used to the peer review. Uh, we hold that up as the gold standard. And um, I don't think that is the gold standard. I actually think that uh, the fact checking uh, process that some of these magazines use is uh, holds, holds things up to a higher standard. You have to triangulate your sourcing, try and find three, sometimes three, three things that point to the same fact to prove that it is uh, uh, solid, worth printing. Um, so it is an arduous process. It is time consuming. Um, and I find it actually rewarding. And uh, the thing that is the most um, uh, it's the word I'm looking for. It's it's I guess shocking sometimes when your story comes back, and it's you know it's clean, and there's just the few little words that have changed that you realize like wow the way that I had phrased it wasn't actually the most accurate. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to introduce you really properly now. Now that I've sort of so I explain sort of the, the perspective that I have on, on, on what you do. Um, as I said, Vivian was the fact checker on the first story that, uh, that I did uh, that was fact checked because she was a fellow at the Walrus. Uh, so the Walrus Magazine is one of our partners here on this project. Um, Vivian went on to become the head of research at the Walrus and helped to establish what I think is the gold standard of fact checking here in this country. Uh, she joins us from, by way of Scotland, uh, where she's currently working on her PhD. Um, and her partner on this project is also here, Alison Baker, Ali Baker, uh, the current head of research at the Walrus. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something here that perhaps should be fact-checked. I think that in that role, uh, I believe that you are coordinating one of the largest teams of fact-checkers in the country. I have not fact-checked. <laughs> I, I hedged it on one of, one of the largest. Okay. Um, Thank you so much for uh, bringing this project to Carleton. Uh, it's been an honor to work with both of you. Um, everything that's happening here over the next few days, for today and tomorrow, uh, is uh, because of, uh, of, of your vision for what you wanted to create. I'm going to ask everyone to welcome you up with a round of applause to introduce us to the project. Thank you so much, Brett. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Uh, um, we're so excited to have you all here for the second day of the Truth and Journalism Conference. Um, first, we wanted to uh, give a little thanks to everybody that has helped and supported us. Um, first of all, the Missioner Foundation that funded our work um, and our, our research over the past year and a half. Um, the Walrus was, as Brett mentioned, a partner for the original project. And my, many of the people in this room um, are Walrus people. <laughs> Walrus friends, wal -ry. Uh So thank you to everyone for their support. Um, thank you to our editorial team on the project uh, and our web team for putting together the, the guide on the website, which we'll show you uh, a little clip of, um, uh, and uh, for putting it together and allowing us to publish it on quite a short timeline. Uh, and thank you to our advisory committee uh, for reading through all of the guide, giving us such incredible uh, notes and comments and edits. Uh, we really were so informed by uh, your, your comments and, and uh, couldn't have done this without you all. Um, so, and also a huge thank you to all the hardworking students at Carleton University School of Journalism and Communication who have served as research and production assistants at different periods during uh, the, the course of our project. And finally, thank you to Brett at the Future of Journalism Initiative for all of your support and Alan Thompson from the School of Journalism um, and also the university's administrative staff for their support on the project and for helping so much with the conference organization. Um, clearly so many thank yous. There's so many more people we should thank and will thank. Uh, we just don't have that much time. <laughs> uh, there's just too many. Um, so as you all know, hopefully our project for the past year and a half has been to create a guide for best practices in editorial fact-checking. Um, and we thought the best way to sort of introduce you all to uh, our work is uh, just presenting the first chapter of the guide um, uh, to sort of also tempt you to read it, <laughs> which you'll be able to find online and we'll, we'll give you the, the info. Um, they're, they're, the online version of the guide is a beta version, uh, so it will be finalized uh, hopefully by next week, but we really were hoping that anybody who uh, goes and has any comments uh, or any suggestions about how to improve it, um, uh, to let us know and uh, we'll we'll put the link on zoom and send it out to everybody online uh, who's watching um yeah so that's <laughs> that's our little intro yeah um so i think the first idea um that kind of grounded our guide is the idea that there are many different ways to tell a story um and journalism is just one of those ways um, it's not necessarily the best way or the kind of most truthful way, um, but there's one thing that makes journalism unique, um, as Tom Rosenstiel um, wrote, uh, who will be our next speaker, um, and that's um, that journalism is essentially a discipline of verification. Um, so what journalists do um, is they don't just report the facts, um, but they actually try to make sure that what they reported is the facts. Um, when a journalist reports a story, they weave their findings together into a narrative. And then before they share it with the world, um, they check that what they've created stands a test of accuracy, whatever they've decided that test to be. Um, and in the 20th century, um, the fact-checking practices of magazines like The New Yorker um, embodied a very thorough version of this verification idea, um, which we've kind of adopted as well. Um, we call it editorial fact-checking because it happened, it's an editorial process, so it happens before, after a reporter has published a story, but before the story is ever published or shown to anyone else, um, the reporter will report the story, the fact checker will come in, take the draft, call everyone back, look at all the sources again, issue corrections, and then it's the corrected version that everyone, that the public will see. Um, and that used to be actually kind of the standard for magazines. Um, and over the past three decades, um, that practice of editorial fact checking has been in decline. Um, mostly as all journalists know, because of a loss of budget, um, you know, no time, no money, <laughs> no resources. Um, so a lot of magazines that once had robust fact-checking departments have shrunk or closed them entirely, or they'll rely on freelance fact-checkers instead. Um, and what that means is that, you know, we don't have a lot of heads of research as Ali <laughs> is today. Um, and so our methodologies for fact-checking vary a lot. Um, there isn't a lot of agreement on how we should do it, what it means to fact-check something. Um, we, as part of our research last summer, we did an informal survey of 10 kind of long form outlets, so magazines, but also podcasts. Um, 
and ask them how they fact check and what that means to them. Um, what we found is that only two out of 10 fact checked everything they published, um, even if you know, in their branding, they would say we're a fact check publication. Um, we both began our journalism careers uh, several years ago, and we both worked as editorial fact checkers um, uh, for a lot of different publications as freelancers, um, and then kind of full-time at The Walrus. Um, and The Walrus does now fact check all of the journalism that it produces. I think in this way, it's quite rare. Um, and we actually have a hard time explaining this to people, specifically because ironically, even though editorial fact-checking has become quite maybe unpopular or rare, political fact-checking has completely skyrocketed. And so when we say we're fact-checkers, nobody thinks we're doing what we actually do. And everyone thinks we're going around and fact-checking politicians and looking at misinformation and fake news. Um, and we kind of want to emphasize that that's very different, um, mostly because we're doing something internal. We're looking at what journalists do. We're trying to make journalism better. We're not criticizing other people. Um, and we're also not doing it after the fact. Um, so we differentiate between editorial fact checking and political fact checking kind of to make this um, clear. Um, yeah, and, and the conclusion of that kind of all the research we did last summer was that due to a lack of transparency and collaboration across the industry, a lack of fact-checking education in journalism schools, um, different journalists have very different standards for what counts as verification. Um, and what that means is that the industry has overlooked really important conversations, um, also about sourcing and record keeping and ethics um, and what it means to be inclusive, but also factual. So that's sort of the ethos of a project. Um, you know, journalists sort of tend to agree that fact checking is really vital to the discipline, but um, few are actually taught uh, about uh, it as a distinct step uh, in their reporting methodology and one that intersects significantly with journalism ethics, as Dirk mentioned. Um, so we believe that if uh, fact checking is the essence of journalism, then journalists need to know, learn how to do it without perpetuating un unequitable standards of verification. Uh, so, for example, how should a fact checker approach a story about uh, first person accounts of sexual violence? Uh, or about an individual's lived experience with disability. These are things that we need to be thinking about and approaching in a very specific way. Uh, there's no one set standard uh, of fact-checking um, for all the stories. It's sort of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so editorial fact-checking is important not only for the sake of journalistic accuracy, but also as a tool for addressing broader issues of trust and inclusion. Um, reporters who operate with a problematic conception of objectivity as the quote-unquote view from nowhere um, often choose to distrust distrust certain uh, voices because of their backgrounds or experiences. They're not, they're not objective enough to report on this. Um, they hold uh, that someone's personal experience with a certain topic may prevent them from understanding or describing it accurately. And so the result of these attitudes is that too often the industry has failed to acknowledge the voices of marginalized communities uh, and to treat their testimonies as credible. And this has sort of led to what writer Pacent Matar and producer Pacent uh, Matar uh, calls a crisis of credibility in media. And Pacent will be giving a keynote on Friday uh, about uh, sort of the, these themes. Um, so questions of sourcing and methodology and fact checking are then intricately related to questions of equity and inclusion, uh, including whether some voices are treated as more authoritative than others. Um, so in this sort of post-truth era that we're in, when many uh, uh, have become more conscious of the fragility of objectivity, it's important for journalists to learn how to acknowledge the close relationship between accuracy and ethical practices. Uh, so in terms of our research, uh, in 20, last summer, in 2021, uh, we were awarded the, the Mishner uh, L. Richard O'Hagan Fellowship for Journalism Education to conduct research on these best practices uh, for editorial fact checking. Um, and at, as journalists in residence at Carleton um, uh, and at the, at the Future of Journalism Initiative, we spent this past year consulting with journalists, with academics and community representatives about the most pressing challenges and also what they think are the possible solutions uh, for gathering and verifying journalistic facts. And we paid particular attention to fact-checking stories that involve trauma, stark power dynamics, um, marginalized communities and questions of identity and lived experience. So the guide that we are launching today is the result of that research. Um, so we, as uh, in my thank yous, I mentioned an advisory committee. So this past summer, we sent the guide to 11 members of the Truth and Journalism Advisory Committee, all of whom um, are credited on our website. And they provided us with comments and feedback um, that we integrated in the guide, which 
uh, sort of goes toward our motivation behind the project as well of it being a very collaborative thing, something that isn't just us setting <laughs> some sort of rule or standard or anything. It's really uh, informed by a lot of uh, different fields and different people. Um, and we, uh, we do agree wholeheartedly with those who say that uh, rigorous fact-checking is an integral part of journalism, but in the guide that we, uh, we've written, we really want to emphasize that it's how journalists uh, fact-check that matters most. Um, the traditional conception of the journalist as an individual investigator who can identify the quote-unquote truth uh, all on their own is uh, outdated and it's impractical. Um, and so the idea at the foundation of the guide, as I mentioned, is that journalism is a social activity made possible by community, including reporters, editors, publishers, sources, their fact checkers, their audience, and anyone else involved in the production of a, of a story or affected by its content. Hmm. Um, yeah, so we've already kind of explained what, fact, what editorial fact checking is, um, but what we want to say is one of the big differences we found from the survey of the industry is whether you call someone back um, when you're fact checking. Um, and there are a lot of publications that fact check stories, but they rely on interview recordings or transcripts um, of interviews. Um, and it was really the, the New Yorker, um, because of kind of other practical circumstances like lawsuits, um, who decided, you know what, we should call everyone back. Um, and we think that was kind of a really big shift in the industry um, a couple of decades ago. Um, and we interviewed uh, Peter Camby, who was head of the New Yorker's fact-checking department um, for nearly three decades um, until 2020. Um, and he likes to say fact-checking is a moral act in part because of this idea that we should call people back. Um, and we think that's really important and a really good idea. I mean, he'll be in a panel um, moderated by Aaron later today. Um, but we think because of its rigor and its emphasis on calling people back and on really reflecting on, on reporting during the editorial process, editorial fact-checking, um, as we think of it, um, pushes journalists to confront certain norms of the industry directly and to question whether they're actually useful in terms of accuracy. Um, so for example, how much of a quote, if any, should a journalist share with a source in advance of publication? Usually the answer is nothing. Um, but actually, when you start to think about things only in terms of accuracy, I think that's more complicated. Um, and then when, if ever, can a source modify or their participation or withdraw completely from a story? Also, usually we say, look, it was on the record. I don't need to do anything else. I have the quote forever. Um, we also think in terms of accuracy, that's not always justified. Um, and more generally, what kinds of consent conversations should take place between a journalist and the source before reporting on a story begins? Um, Answering these questions can help us identify what journalism as a discipline of verification um, requires, which accommodations in particular can be made without harming the integrity of the practice, and which accommodations haven't been made in the past simply because they were difficult or inconvenient. Um, of course, editorial fact-checking cannot solve every problem in journalism. So the fact checker scope is limited to the domain of accuracy, which means they can't decide which stories are covered or who covers them or how they are covered. Um, an individual fact checker is always constrained by the practical realities of the assignment. They usually don't have enough time or resources or institutional support. Um, but we think a lot of issues can be addressed in fact checking alone um, because fact checkers play a special role as the arbiters of journalistic fact, um, including which sources are fit to contest or confirm them. Uh, yeah, so this guide, uh, as Vivian mentioned a little earlier, is focused on verification processes for a piece of journalism. We're not articulating guidelines for any sort of establish, uh, for establishing any kind of truth, uh, storytelling, or publishable content. We're articula articulating guidelines for the publication of fact checked journalism. Um, we hope that this guide can be read by anyone interested in editorial fact checking, including journalists, of course, and journalism educators and students, um, but also members of the wider public just to become more informed about processes and have more transparency in, in how journalism actually works. Um, fact checkers could use this guide as a foundational reference for how to practice their day-to-day -day work. Reporters can use it, the guide to adapt their reporting practices so that they meet fact checking requirements um, and pay particular attention to the ethical considerations that we touch on in the guide. Um, and editors and publishers can use it to incorporate fact checking into their newsroom, including by having editorial conversations as a team uh, before any sort of fact checking 
thing begins. Um, and heads of research employed at publications that already fact checked may also benefit from this guide, especially from the discussions of particularly challenging situations that often arise uh, for fact checkers. Um, and of course, journalism educators and students can use this guide to ground their knowledge of editorial fact checking and of sourcing and research standards more generally. Um, transparency and informed consent are the foundation of responsible journalism. And to that end, we've made this guide public and freely accessible um, online. Uh, you can see it's the Truth in Journalism Fact Checking Guide at the tijproject.ca. Um, when uh, speaking with sources about the fact checking process, journalists can uh, point to certain sections of this guide because it is available and accessible online uh, to make sure that their sources really understand uh, what participation in a journalistic process entails or project entails. Um, and in this way, we hope the contents of the guide will, will also inform and empower the subjects of journalistic stories. Um, and we understand that not Every publication can fact check or can accommodate such a very lengthy, lengthy and costly practice of editorial fact checking. Um, and we don't believe that it's completely necessary to abide by all of these guidelines stringently necessarily. You can, we hope that you can use them and uh, um, sort of weave them into your practice as you are able, uh, as your resources allow. Um, and we emphasize throughout this guide that, again, collaboration between different players who understand their respective roles ensures that journalism and editorial fact checking in particular is helpful, effective, and practiced with integ integrity. Um, yeah, so for the rest of this presentation, we thought we would kind of give you an overview of the content of the guide over about like 15 minutes, and then you'll have some time before the next talk. Um, so, we, uh, there's kind of two parts to this. We have a bunch of principles we've formulated that we hope can be kind of easily memorizable if you would like to learn about editorial fact checking and in particular about the ethics of editorial fact checking. And then we'll go through just um, the structure of the chapters and then you can go read the rest if you would like online. Um, so yes, the two layer principle is kind of the first principle that we introduce um, that's very important because it establishes what editorial fact checking actually is. So the two layer principle says, there are always two distinct steps to establishing a statement in a journalistic story. First, reporting and then verification. Um, ideally, those two steps will be carried out by different people, but even when they're, if they're not, um, you should be thinking actively about these two steps. So if you're following up, you know, you're reporting something and then at the last minute you need to follow up and add a fact, um, you still need to add the second layer after and go confirm it. That's the main idea. Um, um, and then this is a little more theoretical, but also grounds a lot of the guide. Um, so we decided to distinguish between internal and external facts. Um, so say you have a statement attributed to a source. Um, it can be either a person or a, a document or kind of a, a record. <clears throat> um, that statement is always made up of two kinds of facts, internal and external. Um, and those kinds of facts need to be fact checked differently. Um, an internal fact, the fact that's internal to a source means the source will always confirm it. Um, so if you're speaking to someone about their identity, um, they're going to tell you about it. You don't need to do anything else except ask them. Um, and when you have asked them, you've checked it. Um, but if you're talking to someone about what they did yesterday and they say, oh my God, I saw someone like spill their coffee all over Alley. <laughs> um, that is external to them. It's, they're talking about something outside in the world. Um, that could be verified differently and that they could be wrong about. Um, so, and the, the same thing can be said about a document in the same way. So if you say, look, the document um, has Times New Roman font, I'm gonna go look at that document and confirm it. There's nothing else I need to do. Um, but if the document is telling me about someone else, um, it's external to them, I'm gonna have to go find them. So we think this is really important to talk about um, because it makes us understand that facts are, the way that we confirm facts is relative to the source we have been given to check them. Um, and you kind of always need to be thinking about that relationship. And so the next principle is the authority principle. Uh, so every fact is authority, or every um, authoritative fact is fact relative. Uh, so the authority principle holds that um, 
uh, a source is always authoritative on its internal facts, but only sometimes authoritative on its external facts. So for example, the, in the examples that Vivian gave, the source is that uh, if you're calling them to confirm their identity, they are the authority on how they identify. Uh, but if you're calling a source and uh, confirming about how someone spilled coffee on me, you would have to make sure that you also reach out to me because that person can't be the authority uh, confirming my experience of having coffee spilled all over me, which does not sound great. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, so those, uh, the authority principle sort of depends on the source's relationship to those facts and on how those facts were gathered. Um, and the next principle is the independence principle. So every fact should be checked against at least one authoritative source, um, or if that is not possible, several independent non-authoritative sources. Um, uh, and uh, if that's, yeah, and sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think the main thing to say here is we uh, very purposefully and explicitly are not using the primary secondary source yeah. distinction um, because we find it deeply unhelpful. Um, the, the point is kind of trying to list out what kind of primary sources will always be authoritative and what secondary sources will never be authoritative, never works and can lead to kind of problematic sourcing mm -hmm. practices. So you can't figure out what your authoritative source will be until you know what the fact is um, and then you'll be able to continue. Um, yeah, and then um, this is something that really came out of our conversations with people while we were researching. Um, during your work as a fact checker, you're going to encounter facts that are situated in a variety of forms of knowledge. Not all knowledge is printed. Um, sometimes there's oral records of, of facts. Um, there's oral history, but there's also like community experiences. <clears throat> um, you can think of data and statistics as a different form of fact, and you might think of lived experience as a different form of fact. Um, so this knowledge principle says um, you should understand what kind of fact you're dealing with and what form of knowledge it's situated in, and then you should fact check accordingly. So if I tell you I'm reporting on oral history um, and I'm asking you to fact check it, trying to find a printed record of that and saying, well, I can't fact check it because I can't find a printed record means misunderstanding the form of knowledge that you're working with. Um, and so the fact checker kind of should know how to navigate these different forms and then fact check them appropriately. Um, and so the, the next principle is the personal principle. So any fact in a story that uh, concerns someone should be checked with that person. Uh, so this sort of plays into the internal facts and somebody being a, an authority on their own experiences. Um, uh, so uh, this uh, also in, sort of in, goes into our um, real, we are real proponents of having to call everybody back in a, a journalistic piece of work. Um, and that is sort of plays into the personal principle. This, uh, there are very few exceptions uh, that we're um, speaking where you wouldn't speak with a person. So for example, if they are a public figure, uh, you might not necessarily have to reach out to them directly. If it is something that is publicly available, they've said publicly, but if it's something personal that only they would be able to uh, confirm, you would actually have to reach out to that person as well. Um, yes, also coming out of conversation with a lot of people, um, and I think kind of became one of the foundational ideas of the guide is that um, we insist all facts need to be checked before publication, you can't really compromise on that, but how you fact check them, um, I think, is very much a conversation. So if you are fact checking someone's personal story, um, you shouldn't be deciding on your own what kind of sources you're going to ask them for, or how you're going to corroborate, you should call them and you should be like, hey, you know, I have to fact check this, that's not optional. Um, but I'm, I would like to talk to you about how we're going to do that together. Um, and the idea is that um, probably you'll do a better job if you're collaborating. Um, they know their story much better than you. They will know where the sources are. Um, and you can compromise. So if someone says, I, you know, um, I don't think that the police report has the right facts, but I have a lot of friends who can testify for me. Um, it's, you won't know that unless you ask them. And then you can respect uh, what kind of sources they'd like you to use within reason. Um, and this also holds for, for communities as well as people, but we kind of talk about that more in the guide. 
Uh, and the last uh, principle is the power principle. Um, so it calls for fact checkers to be mindful of the power that comes uh, with being the arbiters of truth in, in journalism. And so as a fact checker, you should handle facts with care. You should think about the relationships among people and communities in the story and to treat all forms of knowledge um, as equally valid. Um, so as Vivian mentioned, you know, if you're working with a story based on an oral history and you, you say as a fact checker, well, I can't find document documentary proof of this or I can't find this written down anywhere. That doesn't mean it's any less valid uh, as a source, as a, as a form of uh, corroboration, as um, something that is, you know, a government uh, report or something like that. Basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, those are the main principles that kind of inform everything. And then we thought we would just quickly tell you uh, what's in each chapter and then you can go look for yourself. Um, but um, we essentially start by the first chapters two and three are essentially just um, overviews of how to fact check. So you should be able to read them. And then once you've read them, if you get a really easy story to check or something that isn't kind of sensitive or controversial, you have everything you need. Um, they're quite long and thorough. <laughs> um, and then chapters four to eight um, talk about all the cases where the standard methodology might not be so simple or might not be so appropriate. And so we kind of go into more detail about um, the nuance. I can do four and then maybe do the rest. Um, so chapter four um, really emphasizes the importance of thinking about authority instead of thinking about primary and secondary sources. Um, and we look at a variety of different kinds of knowledge um, to talk about how they should be checked differently. So how should we fact check a scientific piece versus um, a, a number that's, or sorry, a story that's based in numbers versus a story that's based in indigenous oral history and, and kind of how can we see underlying principles that are the same, even though in practice it looks really different. So in uh, chapter five, fact checking language, um, we examine the role of, uh, or the relationship between language and accuracy. So we sort of argue that the, the uh, distinct, uh, the division between the domains of copy editor and fact checker boils down to the relationship uh, between the word and the world in a sense. So a copy editor confirms the spelling and addresses issues of style and grammar, but a fact checker is responsible for ensuring that the right terminology is uh, used and that it act accurately reflects uh, a source or a community is reality. Um, so and then chapter six is uh, fact checking lived experience. It's kind of one of the most possibly contentious uh, topics in fact checking uh, in terms of how to do it appropriately. Um, so if fact checking personal stories is approached insensitively, it can be very harmful and offensive to sources. Um, but if it's if, if, if fact checking is avoided entirely, uh, the resulting lack of verification can jeopardize the story and damage the credibility of its sources, the author, the publisher, and also obviously harm uh, the source themselves. So we argue that the pertinent question isn't whether lived experience should be fact checked as we, we are Already said, but rather how it can be fact checked appropriately. And so this is where the collaboration principle comes in. The fact checker should always collaborate with a source to figure out the best way to fact check lived experience. Um, and in chapter seven, uh, trauma informed and compassionate fact checking, um, we focus on the fact checker's interaction with other people, uh, especially those who have experienced harm. Um, and we discuss how a fact checker can give individual sources agency in the fact checking process uh, while maintaining the standards of accuracy and verification and precision of uh, their, their publication and of fact checking. Um, and we also outline sort of the accommodations that can be made, but, uh, and also what we can't sort of compromise on in that chapter. Uh, and then, um, yeah, and then um, in chapter eight, uh, we talk about um, power dynamics in the role of, in the context of verification, and we discuss journalist responsibilities um, when navigating power imbalances, both power dynamics between different sources and power dynamics between journalists themselves and um, the world. Um, we encourage fact checkers to think of factuality as a practice more than a goal, and to, to think of their work as a way of engaging more relationally with sources and with communities. Um, and then we actually yeah, forgot to put these in the table of contents, but we have two appendices that are just like helpful. Um, so there's a reporter guideline. So if a reporter wants to, to work on a story um, that will be fact-checked, there's kind of just instructions for how to report uh, in a helpful way. And then um, we have a glossary of terms so that you can look at a term if you, yeah. Um, and that's it. Um, Thank you, and please go look online and give us feedback. <laughs> so just in terms of 
next steps. <laughs> Recording has stopped. We can <laughs> off the record. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, just uh, we have about 15 minutes between uh, this this the end of this talk and Tom's uh, Tom Rosenstiel's keynote. Um, so please feel free to grab more coffee and uh, snacks. Uh, we'll be around if you want to chat. And maybe you have questions. And do you have questions? <laughs> sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to know a little bit two things because I've run an academic institution, but I practice as a journalist. On the academic side, you know, at the end of every journal article, whatever they sort of say, you know, research on and on the practical side, what uh, obstacles or challenges do you see for the industry aside from the <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So the the first question is about um, I guess comparing this practice to to more academic writing, where usually um, at the end of a, a paper, we'll kind of the academics will write um, more research needs to be done on this and kind of acknowledge the limitations. And it's true that like that's very much a part that is that editorial fact checkers can't really do. Although I think there's like a, a partial equivalent because um, there are kind of different comments that a fact checker can make on a story. So they can only make comments about accuracy. They can't be like, oh, I don't like this sentence or I wish the story was written differently, um, even though sometimes they try. <laughs> um, but they can say, look, you know, I guess the source you gave me confirms this, but I did some digging. In fact, like they're supposed to do some digging um, and it doesn't seem quite right. Or it seems like we don't know enough um, and we should hedge more. We should write into the story like, you know, according to this one source, but actually things are more complicated. Um, but I think that happens a lot. And the main difference is that the editorial fact checkers work won't be seen in the end. So it's always gonna be in the reporter's voice when it's published, even if it's actually the results of the fact checker um, kind of saying, hey, we don't know this. Um, do you want to do the other one? Uh, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll see the question you did. Okay. Uh, and the second question was, um, Apart from lack of resources, um, what is kind of the big challenge to people implementing this um, in journalism? Good question. <laughs> I, do, I, I also care. Too well. <laughs> I do feel like uh, resources is the the main one. I think, but um, in education, just yeah. knowing, uh, having, we hope that this resource will contribute to the education of of ethical fact checking practices, and I think it's 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 as much the practice as it is the way of thinking about facts and truth and um, that it's not this one, there is no one objective truth. There is no one way to think about things and one person's truth can be, is as valuable and um, accurate as another person's. Um, so I think it's, almost the thinking that might be the biggest limitation because yeah. if we are taught as journalists, you know, our, our institution is founded on this notion of objectivity, right? And that is how we're trained. And it's really hard to sort of get out of that thinking because we have been taught it. Um, so I would I would say it's, it's that apart from the resources, of course. Yeah. But um, also maybe, you know, I think it would take time to learn how to do news reporting yeah. in this way. Like if you have like two hours to report a story, but I also, I don't think it's impossible. It just means thinking a little differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, do you, oh yeah, do you have the, sorry. I think, okay. Um, so you, you mentioned that you want to distance yourself from the notions of primary and secondary sources mm -hmm. and rely more on authoritative sources. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just wondering, because I'm sure you've thought way more deeply about this, but I can imagine some minefields of how to determine what's an authoritative source. And I just kind of wanted you to maybe take us through your, your thinking and you know the pros and cons um, of doing that, because I can imagine some sharky waters yes yes <laughs> i'm opening the list oh, but also yeah. <laughs> um, yeah this is incredibly difficult and yeah. also was not always our plan like i think we wrote a very first draft being like primary and secondary sources and then we had this deep realization that we that it didn't actually work and make sense um because uh there are so many things like 
I think, so we were looking at all these different journalism textbooks. They tend to list, here are your primary sources, here are your secondary sources. First of all, they don't always agree. Um, and then, you know, there's some things are always put in the primary list. Um, so, uh, and I guess the context of this is the kind of standard idea in fact checking is find one primary source or two secondary sources for every fact. So the idea is if you find a source that's in the primary source list, then you're set. Um, you don't need to do any more work. And often it'll be like government reports, police reports, reports published by official institutions. Those are always primary. And then depending on the textbook, maybe newspaper articles are also, maybe books are also, but it kind of, that actually shifts a lot. Um, and actually often when reporters are doing the most work or the work that needs to be fact-checked the most rigorously, it's because they're going against government narrative. They're trying to like report on institutions or powerful people. So the things that are named primary sources are like the things you don't want to use or like don't necessarily want to trust. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're lying. So the idea of authority is kind of like, look, a government report, absolutely authoritative on what the government thinks or like, that's great. Government report, not necessarily authoritative on um, you know, the experiences of the marginalized community that they're writing the report about. Um, and so that list of primary and secondary is no longer as useful. Mm -hmm. And we wanna be able to say, there's a principle for why, if you are reporting on say um, an indigenous community in Canada, um, then looking at records of like, Indigenous Services Ministry, or you know, um, even demographic Indian affairs from yeah. 50 years ago yeah. or something, uh, really like problematic from the perspective of accuracy mm -hmm. and from the perspective of journalistic practice. And like the people who are going to be the way that you're going to find authoritative sources on that is to go look at community knowledge because the primary sources um, are problematic for that. Um, so that was kind of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a question. That is that you've that you've already touched on a bit, but um, I want you to talk about it a little bit more. Um, so, probably the majority of people who work in journalism today, with diminished resources, might look at this very detailed um, report on that's sort of idealizing the best way to do fact checking, and say, "Look, I got an hour." Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to read this thing. This is irrelevant to me. Why? What? How can they use this? Explain why the ideas in here can be stolen, employed, and exploited by people who are moving very fast. Yeah, we actually have a whole section of the about this in the guide, yeah. <laughs> uh, just about variations and adapting to constraints of the, the newsroom we, and the various me, uh, modes of journalism. Because it isn't this is very much editorial journalism. There are resources. There's time. There's hopefully a, a, a full fact checking department. Um, so, yeah. well, we have a list yeah. basically of the kinds of modifications we've seen publication make um, when they call themselves fact checked but maybe don't do what we call fact checking um, and then we've separated them into the modifications that we think um, don't need to be disclosed so um, if you don't have a head of research or you're working with freelancers or you know you're kind of making various accommodations for the process um, sometimes you don't need to tell anyone you can still call it fact checked um, and then we've made a list of modifications we've seen that we think look, you need to be, you need to say that you're doing this or you can't say that you're fact checking. Um, and I think mostly it's when, oh, we actually only fact check like half the stories we do because um, we don't have time or we fact check only the stories um, for freelance writers and not for staff writers. Like then we think, okay, you need to actually disclose this. But there are a lot of variations you can make that you don't need to disclose and that you can still call fact checking um, even possibly if you're, so we spoke with a lot of news reporters and newspapers who we think actually do yeah. an incredible job. Um, and we'll just fact check their own work even under huge time pressure, but they have the principles in mind mm -hmm. that we've been talking about. So like the idea of two layers, like of calling people back, um, of thinking about sourcing. It's really like the mindset that comes from these principles that I think matters more than how you go about actually applying them. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, and we kind of also include little checklists as well that might be helpful for people to refer to if you are just like trying to quickly be like, oh no, how should I be thinking about this uh, story where there is this big power imbalance? Then we do have a little checklist that you can go through instead of reading through the whole guide. That's yeah. more of like a practical thing in the guide, I guess. Um, but I do, I agree with Viv, obviously, that it, it really is just, we're hoping that this can inform people's thinking, even if they aren't applying necessarily each step to their work. Um, it's really, yeah just just yeah trying to change people's minds <laughs> my question my question was going to be very similar because I was thinking of my past life as a daily radio producer and just you know anyway very similar I'm just like how do we apply this in, in very kind of immediate um daily deadlines and if not hourly deadlines so yeah. very similar to what was already asked yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess one thing to say is I think there are some things that are, so I think a lot of things can be adapted to the quick pace. There are some things that can't be, and I think especially in the power dynamics yeah. chapter, because um, for most of journalism, I think, yeah, can all be adapted and changed. And then there are some things like, look, you just need to give people time yeah. sometimes. And I think that just means some stories are not fit to be like immediate news stories. Yeah. Um, so I also think that's worth saying. Maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, over here. Um, okay, first, of, first a comment. Um, I, I had the uh, I had the good luck to hear a presentation from you guys six months ago uh, for the before our Capital Current Summer crew um, uh, began. Um, and uh, one of the things that I was thinking about after that was uh, that I started to absorb. Actually, it's related to the questions you guys were asking because I'm often producing material that I'm not fact-checked for, but I did start thinking more and more about these practices mm -hmm. when I was writing. Um, and it's partly because I've noticed that as I get older, I get stupider. <laughs> um, and so I'm using a lot of these things partly to, to double check myself, mm -hmm. um, uh, to you know kind of <laughs> verify that, did I actually hear that right? And go back and double check and all this kind of stuff. Um, so that's just an observation. Um, the other question I had is, I'm, I'm literally in the midst of um, uh, producing a magazine article right now, and, and the editor was fact checking and um, asked me uh, to verify some quotes. And I sent audio clips of the actual quotes from uh, what I've put in the story. Um, but I, it occurred to me that, well, that's actually going to be very accurate in terms of the verifying of those quotes but of course I spoke with the person for half an hour and there was lots of other stuff you know that was related to that um, conversation uh, so there's there's obviously limitations mm -hmm. in specific fact checking that may not capture the nuance of a whole conversation yeah. um, how do you I guess account for that or or uh, uh, warn about it mm. I guess in the context of this yeah and also yeah, we should do yeah um yeah so i think this actually just boils down to the fact that we think you should actually call people back um <laughs> just because and it kind of because yes the sending recordings or in transcripts that is accurate to what they have said to you in that moment um but as you say like you had a really long conversation they don't know the context in which you're using these uh, these quotes necessarily that might affect the accuracy of the, the way they're being uh, presented in the piece so calling somebody back and going through like it provides them with a bit more context of how they are positioned in the in the story and um how you are using their words and also if you especially if you're working on a magazine feature uh you might have conducted that uh, interview a year ago or longer or you know six months ago and truth is, isn't static, it changes. So what they said to you then, it might still be true to them, but you want to be able to present them with the opportunity to elaborate a little bit more, give you a bit more nuance on, on uh, that, give you a bit more of the nuance that you're looking for, I guess. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I guess yeah. like, but it's not like they get full control. No, I mean, in no way. So like, yeah. I think it's worth saying like, it, it really depends on the circumstance. Yeah. Like if yeah. you're fact checking with a politician, it's not the same thing as yeah. fact checking um, with someone who's telling you about what happened to them. And like, that's the, the worth of having a fact checker is that they can make those decisions. So they can be like, um, they'll call someone and they'll talk to them, but that doesn't mean they're just gonna be like, 
totally, we can change your code however you want and you can change it. It's like, there's a process, um, but what we're doing is we're still having the conversation even if we're not gonna give them full control, yeah. Yes, yeah, we should, so we should, it um, is and, it is yes. time for Tom's talk. <laughs> um, uh, but thank maybe, you all. maybe let's take like two minutes. If everyone wants to get some coffee, yeah. please do. Um, and then in a couple minutes. We'll start.